Okay, today, now that we've talked about 3D wings, we're going to generalize and talk about three-dimensional incompressible flow. So this is basically chapter six of Anderson. So we're going to start with a high-level introduction. We'll go through an illustrative example and then look at the implications for complete aircraft configurations. Everything we've done so far in aerodynamics has more or less been in two dimensions. So we first we looked at the two-dimensional flow over airfoils, and then even when we were looking at lifting line theory for finite wings, basically it was still quasi-two-dimensional because we were really only looking at things in the plane of the wing itself. Moving to 3D in general is really hard. Um, but some specific cases can be solved to get us some insight. And recall, since we're dealing with inviscid, incompressible, and irrotational flow, we have the velocity can be defined as the gradient of a velocity potential. The potential is governed by Laplace's equation. And our wall boundary condition, v dot n equals zero, applies. So let's start looking at a specific case where we can figure out what's going on. So that's the 3D flow over a sphere. So remember in 2D, we had flow over a cylinder. Uh, which was given by uniform flow plus a doublet. And we can do exactly the same thing in three dimensions. The detailed derivations in the text, um, the result is really what we're interested in because we don't really care about the fine details of 3D flow over spheres in general, um, but I'm going to give a very brief summary of the derivation uh, here so that we can see what the key takeaways are. So we start with the idea of a 3D point source, so this is the equivalent to the source or sink flow in 2D, um, and basically if we have axes Z, Y, X, then if our point source is at the origin, it's basically shooting out fluid in every direction. And if we define a, a spherical coordinate system, we can have some radius r twisted over at some angle of phi and tilted down at some angle theta, then the velocity potential is going to be some constant, negative some constant over r, and the velocity field, the gradient of the potential, is c over r squared in the radial direction. And this is a sink if c is less than zero. So we can define the strength of the source, again, which is actually just the volume flow rate. And that's going to be 4 pi times that constant from integrating all around. And so we can get that the radial velocity is the strength over 4 pi r squared. So the potential 
is negative strength 4 pi r. Again, if lambda were negative, we would have a sink rather than a source. Okay, so now we can move to the concept of the 3D doublet which is exactly analogous to the 2D version. So basically, we take the limit as the separation distance between equal and opposite source and sinks go to zero as their strength becomes infinite so that the product stays constant. And if we do that, we come up with a potential, which is negative mu over 4 pi cos theta over r squared, where this new thing mu is the doublet strength. And 2d, this is the equivalent of kappa. So then the velocity is again given by the gradient of the potential, so that's mu over 2 pi cos theta over r cubed in the radial direction plus mu over 4 pi sine theta over r cubed uh, in the theta direction plus 0 in the phi direction. Note we've got this r cubed dependence where we had an r squared dependence in 2D. So keep this in mind as we move forward to start seeing what the key differences are. Now if you look at the streamlines of this doublet, it's a little tricky to draw, but I'll try my best. There's our axes, x, y, z. And basically, if we have some angle Psi, we see at phi, we see that the flow doesn't depend on this angle. So there's going to be some net flow in a certain direction, and there are going to be loops of flow driving this, just like in 2D, except that these are now all the way around so that this is a we can revolve this streamline pattern around the z-axis so this is what we call an axisymmetric flow so that means the flow is three-dimensional but the flow field depends only on two of the spatial var variables so there's no variation in the side uh, phi direction even though we we do have a non-zero uh, velocity in that direction, or in yes, in, in that uh, in any plane. We, it's not a plane or flow, but there's zero phi velocity. You could even have a non-zero phi velocity if it didn't vary around. We'd still have an axisymmetric flow. Uh, 